So welcome to our second panel, which is on housing. Many of you know that the, we are suffering from a housing crisis here in Los Angeles, California. So I am, I am pleased to bring up um, our moderator for today, um, Tammy Mack, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Beverly White from NBC News. Beverly White has been a general assignment reporter for NBC since 1992, where she covered a variety of local and national stories for NBC. In 2018, White received the National Association of Black Journalists, NABJ, <laughs> Chuck Stone Lifetime Achievement Award. Among her many honors, White earned the 2017 Leadership Award from Capital Alpha, the Journalism Honor Society at Cal State Northridge, and the 2012 Distinguished Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists and the 2008 California Legislative Black Caucus Leadership Award. I know that she has covered housing and homelessness issues um, here in Los Angeles, and we are so proud to have her here today. Beverly White from NBC News. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I know there's a pastor on the panel and others in the room, so let's try this again. A little energy, if you don't mind, a little call and response, as it were. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It is a beautiful day to be indoors at long last. I don't know about you all, but I'm ready for a bonfire with all my masks in it, because I've been wearing them forever and I miss your smiling faces. So it's a blessing to be here with you to moderate such an important panel. So let's dive right in. Since we know we're starting a little bit late, we will make it up in the air, as they say, in flight. We all know that housing is a human right. Again, that's the mantra for the day. But talking about housing in particular, getting down in the details, it takes some thought and heart. And that's why we've got this distinguished panel with us today. A uh, couple of folks are going to be running late. We'll welcome them when they arrive. But in the meantime, please welcome and hold your applause, Senator Ben Allen, California State Senator Ben Allen, who represents California's 26th Senate District. Ben has championed housing legislation, promoting housing first to tackle the homelessness crisis and legislation that would remove barriers to building affordable housing. He's a champion of environmental equity issues and protecting open space and the California coast. Now you can applaud for Senator Ben Allen. This is his moment to speak for, in fact, three minutes on the topic of housing. Sir, are you good to go? Or shall we introduce everyone? OK, whatever is comfortable for you. And our, uh oh, speaking of late arrivals. Hello, Kevin. <laughs> That's all right. He was actually at the top of my list. Let's uh, regroup because he's sitting closest to me. Please welcome, as he works the room, like good politicians do, Kevin DeLeon from LA City Council. He represents District 14, is the former California State Senate President, where he passed landmark legislation moving $2.2 billion with a B dollars into homeless housing. Sanctuary State for California, the first in the nation, and 100% renewable energy by 2045. As a council member, Kevin DeLeon has brought forward a comprehensive plan to house our unhoused community, setting a goal to house 25,000 people in the homeless community by 2025. Again, city council member, Kevin DeLeon. All right, now that we have introduced Ben Allen already. Let's skip over to the next seat. That would be Senator Henry Stern. Ooh. Henry Stern represents the 27th Senate District. He recently championed rental assistance and eviction moratorium legislation in the state Senate. He recently penned an op-ed exploring new ways to combat chronic homelessness and is dedicated to addressing hunger issues. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Henry Stern. And seated to his left is Miguel Santiago. He represents the 53rd District in the California Assembly. He currently serves as chair of the Assembly Select Committee on Los Angeles County Homelessness, where he is focused on finding urgent solutions to end homelessness. He has championed forward-thinking legislation on housing solutions for low-income and homeless communities and is leading the charge on renters' rights, rental assistance, and public banking. Miguel Santiago. Thank you. 
Next, we have Sue Hemmelrich. She is representing the city of Santa Monica on the city council since 2014 and was recently elected mayor. That's Mayor Sue to the room. Mayor Sue. She has advocated for, this is key, she has advocated for affordable housing in Santa Monica, spearheading the POD program to help keep rent control tenants in their apartments. And she is a champion for our homeless community, working for several years with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Mayor Sue, thank you for being here. Now, Seppi Shine is also here with us. Seppi, please wave and let everybody know where you are. She's also here representing West Hollywood City Council. Council member Seppi Shine was elected to the West Hollywood Council in 2020. She has served on the city of West Hollywood's Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board and led many boards and organizations, including the LGBT Bar Association of Los Angeles. And as a board member, a board of governor, excuse me, and steering committee leader with the Human Rights Campaign LA. Most recently, Seppi Shine has been a co-organizer of West Hollywood's Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And on the WeHo City Council, she is championing, championing, <laughs> that is a tongue twister, championing renters' rights and affordable housing. Seppi Shine, thanks for being here. <laughs> Representing the Los Angeles Community College Board is Stephen Veris. Veris, excuse me, Stephen. There you are. Stephen is president of the LA Community College District where he champions hunger and housing issues for struggling community college students, and there are too many. He serves as special advisor to the California State Senate and has worked for the former Senate president. Uh, rounding out the panel in the snappy hat is Pastor Kelvin Sauls, the former senior pastor at Holman United Methodist Church. He's an ordained elder in the California Pacific Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church and on the City Commission of Lhasa, the LA Homeless Services Authority. He currently serves as director of interfaith initiatives at community health councils in Los Angeles and Reverend Sauls and everyone else here on the panel will engage us now for three minutes apiece, starting with Kevin DeLeon. Mr. DeLeon, please um, find a microphone, sir, so everyone in the room can hear you and speak with us on, of course, the topic of the day of this particular panel. Well, first of all, th thank you so Homelessness or housing? Housing. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank housing. you so very much, Beverly. It's, it's an honor to be here with each and every one of you. Uh, I am so looking forward to listening to the incredible panelists that we have here today, the expertise uh, as they testify uh, to the crisis of our time, which is the issue of housing and the issue of affordability, to be more specific. Listen, this is the second largest city uh, in America, and clearly one of the wealthiest uh, cities uh, on planet Earth. But the very fact that we have uh, an eviction tsunami that is near the horizon, if it's, we don't have enough state intervention, uh, proves that we have a structural uh, deficit. A structural deficit with regards to policy as it relates to putting a house over everyone's uh, uh, head, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they come from, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of who they love, uh, which God they pray to, and yes, regardless of their legal status. Because as human beings, as Angelinos, housing is a universal right. It is not a privilege for the exclusive and the wealthy. Again, in the fifth largest economy on planet Earth. So uh, I am looking forward to, to sharing and, and, and more than anything, listening to, to all of you and the exchange that we'll have as we move forward uh, bold policy, uh, both at the local and state level, to improve the human condition for all individuals, to provide accessibility and affordability when it comes to housing. Listen, um, single family homes are a premium, as we know, and we see how the bids are going up. If the bids are going up so high right now, how are we going to get folks who are very low income, low income, and middle class into housing? whether it's rental or whether it's actual purchase of, of a home. So I am looking forward uh, to the engagement with each and every one of you. And to Susie Shannon, uh, I just want to thank you very much for the, the honor that you have given me to be on this panel with, with great you know, uh, leaders uh, throughout the city and through the state. Let's give it up for Susie Shannon, everybody. Yeah. Susie Shannon. Yeah. Susie Shannon. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. And speaking of LA City Council, our last late arrival would be Mike Bonin. Mike, that's all right. You're still welcome, Mike, with us. Thank you for being here. Uh, well, he probably ran into some traffic, yes? I, I, I did, and I'm not as familiar with downtown as my colleagues are 
<laughs> I just went through the alleys. Yeah. <laughs> I need to give you a formal introduction, sir, and then we'll work you into the discussion, because it's just getting started. Your timing is perfect. Mike Bonin has served on LA City Council, representing the uh, 11th District since 2013. His work is focused on building mass transit and reducing traffic, speaking of, and ending homelessness, protecting the environment, and passing a $15 minimum wage strengthening public safety and fixing the city's broken development process to better serve residents and put neighborhoods first. Please welcome Mike Bonin. Now we're gonna go with the flow of the show and just take our speakers from my left all the way in that direction. So our next speaker would be the Honorable Ben Allen. Ben, please give us three minutes of your time on the topic of housing. Well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here in this beautiful place. Uh, with so many friends and partners in this incredibly important struggle uh, to address our homeless challenges and our housing challenges. And of course, we, we all know that they're all very connected, as, as are our hunger challenges that we discussed this morning. Uh, you know, there's, there's been a, a lot of, of, of heated debate up in Sacramento and, of course, down here in Los Angeles about how to address our, our housing challenges. There are some uh, who I think think this is simply a supply and demand question. I think there's a lot more complexity to our, to our housing challenges here in Los Angeles. There's issues that we have to focus on affordability. That, of course, is at the center of our, of our series of problems. Uh, there's, the, of course, renter protections and how we really focus in on the challenges of, of, of trying to make a rent you know, make, make your rent uh, 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 work and make sure it's not too damn high uh, here in, in Los Angeles. And um, so, you know, Henry and, and uh, several of us are, are uh, some senators who have been really trying to focus on, on solutions that uh, work with local government, work with activists, and work with local advocates such as Susie and others uh, to ensure that we're, we're coming up with some, some better solutions. And um, you know, I've, I've got a bill, SB 563, that I've been working on very closely with our friends and partners from Santa Monica for renters' rights and other uh, Move LA and other advocates that, that focus on tax increment financing and focus with a focus on, on homelessness prevention and, and affordability. Uh, working on Article 34 repeal, there's a portion of the state constitution that puts up a lot of barriers to the construction of public publicly funded affordable housing. Currently, for any publicly funded affordable housing, it, it requires a citywide vote to allow that to move forward. That was something passed in 1950 at a time when uh, it was clearly being done for, for racially prejudiced reasons, and we're, we're hoping to figure out a way to get that repealed from the state constitution. Uh, I, so, so anyway, I just want to say I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to hear from all of our, our panelists. Uh, you know, ultimately, this is about trying to find ways to solve our problems that, that don't that don't impose a one-size-fits-all model from Sacramento, uh, but that really focuses in on the needs of communities on the ground, uh, that really focuses in on affordability and, and access. Uh, that's, those are the kinds of solutions that I'm hoping to hear about today on our panel uh, as, we, as, we, as we seek to, to tackle this enormously challenging issue of trying to figure out ways to get more people housed in an affordable manner. Uh, it is a, it's a broken system that we have, and we have to fix it. Thank you, sir. Senator Stern, your thoughts. Uh, well, thank you. I'll, I'll reiterate the, the applause for Ms. Shannon. You know, um, when people actually get you out of your comfort zone and you leave the fancy walls of the Capitol, even a, you know, uh, a room like this feels so illustrious and all the titles, and you just go out onto the street um, and work with people, uh, you, you, you change your head. And I think this, this group that's here today are people who can float between both circles. And it, it really, that's what it's gonna take, is people who are not afraid to roll up their sleeves. That's, that's how the council members here, or Miguel, I mean, the way they work uh, directly with the community is the only way we're gonna get through this. So we can spend all the time we want in Sacramento coming up with uh, big policy ideas, but until we're actually grounded in this poverty crisis that's driving Los Angeles into a place of, of homelessness, of exacerbating the systemic racism that has put us in this place where we've been redlining this town for a very long time and people are still stuck, and now we have to dig our way out of this challenge. And it's not just gonna be through supply of market rate housing in Los Angeles. That's not actually what's gonna fix it. I mean, I, it, when you, if you wanna talk about RENA, LA has been hitting its market rate RENA numbers for the past few years. We've actually been hitting those numbers. Those, those units are getting built. 
Um, I, I represent a lot of areas that those units are getting built in, and I'll tell you, they're not, they're not middle class or even uh, working class folks getting in there. You want to go build the hill up in uh, a new house up in the canyons of Topanga or, or up in uh, Brentwood or even out in Santa Clarita or Calabasas? Good luck with less than a million dollars in your hand. And frankly, these things are selling for 10, 20 million dollars right in the middle of our fire zones in areas that are actually pulling resources out of communities that are experiencing poverty. We're Compton subsidizing Calabasas, McMansions. You've got a problem, right? So we have a strange paradigm now where this housing crisis can sort of be used as a proxy for all kinds of other agendas. And I'm, I'm, I gotta say, I'm, I'm skeptical about some of these pushes, but there's also a lot of signs of hope. Uh, Senator Allen's been an incredible leader on this, and we've been looking at things like tax increment financing and adding more dollars to the equation, finding ways to get more inclusionary housing and try to leverage our commercial use and be able to flip that easily into residential use. There's an important bill that just moved out of the Senate on that front that if we feel like emphasizes affordability, then we can start using some of our vacant and unused retail and commercial spaces uh, in this city and more broadly. Um, and then when it comes to LA solving its issues, we can't have a bunch of lines between city, county, and state. <clears throat> We're gonna all need to hold hands together and put one big trust together that's actually gonna be able to so start solving this crisis. And that's about getting direct rental assistance into people's hands. That's about dealing with affordability covenants and trying to keep people in their homes to prevent homelessness, right? It's not just about going to the streets, it's about pe people right on the edge and find a way to serve them. So there are solutions out there, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from some of our experts and testimony here today to, 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 to really ground us the way, the way that Susie does, but the way, frankly, that all of you do every day um, out doing your work. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. No worries. Thank you, Senator Stern. Uh, Assembly Member Santiago, as we continue with the conversation from the panelists, let's uh, make our statements a minute or two rather than three so we can respect the room and engage with the folks who've also come to share their thoughts. So take it away, sir. Yeah, but absolutely. Briefly. That's why I, I feel the burn with Stern. <laughs> <laughs> and over here, um, Miguel Bonin. <laughs> No, but in all seriousness, look, um, welcome to 53rd District. And, and I want to say, look, that early on when we talked about rental assistance and we began that conversation at the beginning of the end of last year, folks thought that it was too much of $5 billion to ask for at a time that we uh, were facing a budget deficit. Uh, as of today's actions, uh, meaning a build in print, we'll vote on it uh, on Monday in the legislature, uh, that would prevent um, uh, the evictions from happening. and. Uh, at, up until, uh, well, starting um, October 30th, and would give 100% uh, rental assistance. So we've come a long ways on this conversation about, uh, yes, it is, and for most people who don't know, and I'll announce it right now, the bill's in print, and Monday we'll vote on it that will give 100% uh, uh, rental assistance and extend the eviction moratorium uh, past October 30th. So that's the good news, right? I wanted to make sure we said that. But look, I think the real big challenge, I, I think there, there is a merited conversation about housing stock but there needs to be a tougher conversation about the affordability of housing and what affordable really means. Because yes. sometimes if you take a look at the conversation of affordable housing as defined by other areas in the state, you're talking about 120% AMI. And when you're taking a look at some of the areas that we represent, uh, you're taking a look at even 50% AMI being way too high when people in some of our areas are making 36,000 uh, average medium income uh, for a family of four, or the district that I represent, uh, that it, uh, two years ago, the average medium income for over 150,000 residents was, was um, at the federal poverty line. And so affordability has to be defined in something in terms of what working communities can actually do, not affordability as somebody who has a professional job. And so they mean two different things. You know, but, but I will also say the, the development has to change in terms of conversations because we've, we've got to take a look at new and different ways to do it. Uh, I partnered with some folks in the room here, Housing is a Human Right, AHF and others, to take a look at modular, to take a look at adaptive reuse because if, unless you take a look at different forms of development, we're always going to do the same thing over and over and then wonder why permanent supportive housing is costing $750,000 a unit. I mean, when, we, when, when it doesn't actually really make sense that it would cost that much. Assembly and member, I'm going to interrupt you so we can keep it moving. But yeah, but they got three give me 30 and I got one. <laughs> <laughs> 30 more seconds. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, we'll get back to it. And I, I, I could see the council member Bonin is like nodding in affirmation. You want to jump right in, sir, with your thoughts on housing? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I agree with everything M Miguel just said, particularly the part about uh, feeling the burn. Uh, <laughs> because actually, I'm going to say, s sitting next to a fellow person who, who, who uh, uh, endorsed Bernie Sanders, <laughs> is a lot of what Bernie Sanders talked about in the campaign is exactly what we need to be doing in order to truly address the affordable housing crisis. Uh, we need to uh, ju just fundamentally, and let's get down to the basics of it, we need to fundally, fundamentally start addressing housing as a human right and not as a commodity. Uh, we need to start treating housing as something that people live in and not something that people invest in. And, and too much over the past couple decades has, we've, we've shifted to this thing where housing is something where people invest in. And it has been gobbled up by, by, by hedge funds and, and investment firms. Uh, and it's no longer something that, that is actually uh, about providing a place for people to live. And so there is a, there's a national uh, movement around the country uh, behind a number of things that would sort of change our approach to, to housing. And, the, and in Congress, there's bills that have been introduced by Ilan Omar and, and, and AOC that really get to the crux of this. One of the most important things we have to do, and I'm pushing this at the state level, and there's legislation in Sacramento to do the same thing, is we need to start doing some social housing. Uh, social housing is, is not the way we do public housing here in Los Angeles or in the United States where it's segregated and underinvested and ghettoized. It's actually something like they do in, in, in Europe and in parts of Asia where it is government owned uh, or publicly owned, uh, managed by land trust or nonprofits. Uh, it is mixed income, it is subsidized, it is, it is sort of central to community. We need to be doing things like that. We need to be cracking down on, on speculative real estate. Um, uh, we need to be supporting legislation that would do significant reinvestments in the existing uh, public housing uh, we have here in the United States as part of a Green New Deal uh, and, and retrofit those buildings and make them safe. Um, and uh, here in Los Angeles, there's a number of groups, not just those who are in involved here today, but a number of groups that have been pushing that kind of stuff, uh, groups like Act LA and like SAGE and like ACE and like POWER, uh, and there's a real growing grassroots movement behind this, and that's the kind of things we need to be pushing, and I get the end signal, and I'm done. Yes. Mayor Sue, jump right in, please. Um, Okay, well, I'll go before Seppi, and, and uh, oh, I, I've listened, ditto everybody, I love Susie. Uh, we do not have a housing crisis in this state or in this country, we have an affordable housing crisis, and they are different animals. Um, it, it, and uh, I was on the hunger panel, so let me just say that it's not just hunger and it's not just housing. It is the inequitable distribution of wealth and poverty that is keeping people from ever having voices. Um, and that said, I'll move on to the next person because I want to hear from the panel, most of whom I know. So thank you. <laughs> All right, and Seppi, please jump right in. Forgive me for skipping you over. Thank you. Uh, um, no worries. Um, thank you, Susie Shannon for, and staff for organizing this. I'm honored to sit on this panel with such incredible folks. Um, and I agree with uh, Mayor Himmerlich, we do have an affordable housing crisis. And these are facts related to housing that we cannot ignore. We have over 161,000 people in our state that are homeless, and we have a severe lack of affordable housing. People, especially renters, are at risk of losing rent-stabilized housing because of this pandemic's financial effects. West Hollywood was actually created to protect renters, seniors, and the LGBTQ community, and we have done that. West Hollywood has been on the forefront of inclusionary housing policy since our inception with a minimum 20% affordable housing requirement before any other city had it on almost all residential and mixed use developments, and we're looking at smart ways of making this policy better for, to create more affordable housing. We work with our affordable housing partners to invest in and develop affordable housing using our affordable housing trust fund, and we are constantly looking at ways to develop more affordable housing through policy changes, including right now on our city-owned land. With respect to renters, we have had a strong rent stabilization ordinance and have always provided funding for renters who needed it when they fall on hard times. During the pandemic, we were the first city to institute a strong eviction moratorium, and we have since expanded our assistance to renters with five rounds of rental assistance, and we will continue doing so until our renters are out of this uh, pandemic's financial effects. 
I was proud to initiate the strongest anti-harassment ordinance in LA County with a colleague of mine, Council Member Erickson, which passed unanimously this past Monday with a tenant habitability plan and notice requirements to help keep tenants safe and in their homes. We need to pass ordinances like this across cities. We need to work together regionally and statewide to create practical and creative solutions to keep people housed, create housing that low income and ordinary people and young people can afford and to house our unhoused neighbors and provide the services they need to get them back on their feet. I'm looking forward to hearing from and engaging with all of you. Thank you. Yes. Stephen from the Community College Board. Please, sir, jump right in because I know your constituency includes young people struggling with housing. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, uh, it's been just about 10 years since I first was elected to this board. Um, and uh, when we initiated our work back then, it was a lot of conversation about um, transferring students, workforce development, certificates, moving students along. And um, through the path of understanding why the numbers in Los Angeles weren't quite as good as some of the numbers in other uh, spaces, um, we clearly targeted that um, a big deal about student success lies in basic student needs. And the fact that there's tremendous insecurity issues, our students face food insecurity, they face housing insecurity, and frankly, they face homelessness. Um, to give you a sense of a, a study, that's a survey that's coming out in the next uh, few weeks, 40% uh, of our students um, feel food insecurity. 55% uh, feel housing insecurity. 13% uh, experience homelessness. Now, we're coming off of um, the worst pandemic um, that uh, all of us have experienced. Um, but to translate it into our, 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 our we're a working class uh, part of the higher education system where doors are wide open. Our students work. A third of them are parents. But to give you a sense, the full-time employees Students that were full-time employees, 36% of them lost their job during COVID last year. 23% of them had their hours reduced. Of the part-time students, 47% lost their jobs last year. 25% got their hours reduced. There's a huge gap. Now, um, I'm glad to know that one of the panelists here is a tremendous partner for us in trying to um, uh, close the gap and, and, and deal with the student uh, uh, basic needs. But there's a few things we need to think about in general. We need to think about how financial aid isn't just for student fees and books. Financial aid is for the whole total student experience. Um, we had to understand that we got to reduce the barriers to work with partners in the community to be able to work together to see a community college system be a system that works with cities and counties and the nonprofit, uh, non governmental entities around us. And secondly, we have to understand that we're also places where we have land and that. Um, principally built for commuter campuses. Um, we have fairly large pieces of land that we've got to figure out what are the best ways, what's the future of how we plan and design our spaces there. And, and a lot of that's gonna be um, with the feedback and, and, and the thoughts and ideas you have together here. Because it's not just about providing a dormitory. It's really about providing affordable housing for students. And that's important, thank you. Sir, Reverend Sauls, please um, pick up the theme. We're talking housing here, sir. Yeah, just uh, uh, briefly to mention, uh, earlier on, <clears throat> uh, I shared a little bit about uh, the challenges uh, being in this virtual space for the last 12 plus months. Uh, and I shared that uh, a lot of us have had a lot of frustration with that. Uh, the one I shared this morning was the one that you start talking and then somebody says to you, you are muted. <laughs> and then you have to unmute yourself. And I uh, uh, wanted to acknowledge the fact that these hearings really is an opportunity uh, for us to be unmuted and mm -hmm. to bring amplification to folk who are on the front lines, you know, and, and doing the necessary grassroots work around dealing with this moral challenge, you know, of an epidemic before the pandemic uh, called houselessness and quality and affordable housing. The uh, uh, one that I want to use this time around uh, is, you know, uh, when you're on Zoom or whatever platform you would use, you can be on camera or off camera, right? Uh, so this morning I had a LASA commission meeting, so I was driving here, so I was off camera. These hearings are really 
challenging all the ways that we have made invisible the people affected you know, by houselessness. Uh, it's time that it gets to be on camera in terms of what needs to be done around this epidemic even before the pandemic. And there will be no going back to normal around this because this epidemic will still be you know, going on even after the pandemic. Let me close by saying that the uh, moral crisis of houselessness and the need for affordability and quality housing is a structural and an institutional challenge. I agree that the issue is not just housing, it's not just affordable housing. I dare say it is having the necessary sense of urgency and creativity, innovation, and political will to do what we need to do to deal with this crisis that we are facing. And today is an opportunity to listen, to learn from those who've been on the forefront and to see how we can leverage their, uh, uh, their vision and their voices to see how we can disrupt the drivers of this disparity called housing. Thank you. Sir, thank you, Reverend Sauls. We want to thank, of course, our panelists and our testimonials from this amazing group facing me. And now's the time for community questions. Anybody in the room who cares to engage in questioning, you'll be handled by Susie. You want to come back to the microphone, my dear? As it is time for yours truly to transition to my job. And thank you all for your kind attention. God bless you all. take questions um, from the hearing board here to um, the panelists. So is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Kevin DeLeon. Thank you very much, uh, Susie. And, and thank you very much, Beverly White. We're looking forward to seeing you tonight on NBC. You know. um, I have a question for Michael Weinstein. Uh, Michael, you have put forth through a full times uh, ad, a uh, full page ad, I should say, in LA Times, $100 million. And from a, a 501c3 nonprofit agency or, or a particular uh, individual of wealth, um, that is very rare, that's very unique, short of a government bond, uh, dollars from the federal government, dollars from the state, or dollars from local government. Um, I've, I've heard folks say that you would possibly put more than $100 million if you saw the wheels of the machine turning in such a way that would help accelerate the ability to produce stock inventory uh, uh, for housing, whether it's for very low income, low income, mm. or unhoused community members. Can you go a little more uh, in, in detail uh, with regards to what you think it will take to turn the wheels of that machine that seem to be working, working counterclockwise uh, because for me, and I think for anyone in particular, if they hear someone say, listen, I'll put $100 million on the table. All I want from you is collaboration, cooperation, so at the end of the day, I can purchase this physical asset and whatever upgrades need to be made as a result uh, based on the price point. Uh, don't you know, obstruct, don't sabotage, uh, don't slow walk this to death because as a result, folks get evicted or folks die 1,383 people who died last year living on the streets, experiencing homelessness. So can you go a little in detail? Sure. Well, first of all, you know, the mayor has said that nonprofits, developers for, for low income housing will have concierge service, okay? I don't think you'd stay at any hotel that had that type of concierge service, okay? It's a nightmare. I mean, so that's the inspection process, right? In fact, 100-year-old buildings that were totally dilapidated, as soon as we started fixing them up, we were just attacked by inspectors, okay, F finding fault with everything that we did. And when you submitted the plans, they were approved, and then when the inspection happened, they said, well, we don't like that. T tear that out. And then the next inspector would come and say, 
Oh, no, no, that, that's not right. Okay, so, so the, the whole inspection process. In fact, <clears throat> I know that this is, may sound very difficult, but there should be some code abatement for very old buildings, too, because that's driving up the cost tremendously. We don't want to put anybody's health or safety at risk, but there should be some flexibility in that regard. I mean, another issue is we are uh, intending to build 204 units at the corner of uh, 7th and San Julian, right? That, that's, I call, the corner of hell and purgatory, okay? Uh, that, people who know that corner, it's tough, right? That's the, in, in Skid Row, right across the street from the fire station. Right, the, the busiest fire station in America in because of the mm. EMS, right? Okay, for that, they, they intend to charge us $2.6 million in fees for uh, DWP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. DWP, standard time when you're going into a 100-year-old building to install enough power to keep it electrified, keep the elevator running, standard is nine months to get uh, a vault or, or, or inspection, okay? The other piece of it is we introduced legislation that said if you are 100% very low income or extremely low income, that you should not have to pay property tax, okay? That was vetoed by Governor Newsom. Um, so I mean, there are, there are, I, could go, I could go into more technicalities. One, one last one that's really important is, if somebody is making a commitment to build 100% affordable housing, low-income housing, then they should be able to contract with the city and the county in advance for, for uh, vouchers or rents credits, right? Uh, which they can, is not possible. So we bought a building in the valley, 76 units. It's a beautiful motel, okay? So first we tried with room key, and, and then it turned into home key, and we, you know, okay. So it stood empty for 14 months. We could have rented it right away. It was perfectly suitable. But, you know, in order for, to be eligible for those programs, install a kitchen, you know, if it, we, did, we tried doing all that, okay? None of that, none of that worked. Finally, <clears throat> that was the one project of these 10 that we've had that we've actually been able to make a deal with Lhasa, okay? But again, if people are putting money on the table at the front end, then you should guarantee them the support on the back end. So in conclusion, what I'm hearing from you is you or anyone else would never put anyone in, in harm's way in a building that's dilapidated and would put an individual at risk for their right. life. But that being said, if we have a modicum, a baseline with regards to what the safety, safety requirements are, all the added criteria, if you will, given that you know we need a roof over folks' head or keep folks you know, uh, uh, housed, that we need to really delve down and start taking out over you know, uh, zealous regulations so we can expedite, accelerate, or even will, a the simple process. thing. Even a simple part would be simply say, we're going to give you 12 months to do these things, rather than saying you can't have anybody stay in the building during that period of time, right? I mean, like, one of the people from the county I was talking with about vouchers, he said, well, the county doesn't like rooms without bathrooms. I said, really? I said, so you'd rather people relieve themselves on the sidewalk? You know, I mean, that's just how crazy sure. it is. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Senator Allen has a question. We want to make um, the question and answer pretty quick because we are waiting to go into the next panel on homelessness. Yeah, no, so uh, first of all, thank you for, for the fantastic testimony. Um, you know, one of the things that's come up in your discussion is this whole question, uh, you know, the people would feel more comfortable with some of the bills making their way through in Sacramento if they knew it was really about an individual's right to have some more flexibility with their own home. But we all know that because of you know, con constitutional jurisprudence, basically, corporations are considered people. So all of the same uh, rights that we give to an individual, we, ha we have to extend to a corporation. And um, so this doesn't end up, you know, what, what, what is presented as like a nice oh, hey, you know, you can split your lot for yourself, you know, and maybe have the second lot on your property, go to your kid or, or, or to a family member, or you can sell it or, or lease it out. 
And, and that's something that I, I think we would all feel a little bit more comfortable with if we knew this was actually being done by real people, real people, not paper people. Um, and yet we all know that, that the, the, the problem with a lot of these, um, these efforts is that they, will, uh, that, that they, they could very well um, empower uh, uh, massive corporations, as we've discussed, people who come in, corporations that come in, and just buy up neighborhoods. And, and um, it's this commercialization, this corporatization of housing that you were just talking about. So understanding that we unfortunately have this corporation as people, as person, principle that has been read into our Constitution, for better or for worse, uh, for a long, long time. Uh, you know, does anybody on the panel or, or on the board know of a good example of somewhere in the United States where they've been able to um, work within this, this constraint, this constitutional constraint, to, um, to effectuate the kind of housing production that I think, I think that everybody here wants, which is, which is people-centered housing production as opposed to uh, massive developer, um, commoditized, corporatized housing development. I, 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 I'm so interested in if there's a good, good high quality example out what there that we can trust? learn from. What about land trust? There are land trusts all the across the land trust. Country. Yeah. Okay. So right. And so you know, and our colleague um, Sydney Comlogger has got a great bill that the LA Times just editorialized uh, SB 769. Um, so maybe that's the path. I don't know. Uh, maybe that's the path. Thank you. If anyone else has any other ideas you want to bring up. So, and, and thank you for bringing, bringing it, it back to focus. The, there may not be many um, case studies who've, who've looked at how to manage the competition in the marketplace that takes place around single family housing. But that's the, the point that I was trying to make is it's time now to be intentional and to look at the elements of what drives housing prices and it, it you know not and i'm not speaking of new construction because uh, michael's just talked about the cost of construction and what that looks like and and i've talked to a a, a buddy who builds child care centers and he literally had to stop for six months building a child care center because the cost of lumber multiplied three times within that six months so so those are real things but but what can be controlled is what resources we bring to the table for, for folks, for people, I guess the best way to say it, who want to buy homes in specific neighborhoods or in Southern California or in California where we're, we're, we're leveraging the resources that are the financial institutions and we're leveraging the resources that are the, the working capacity of individuals to, to, to minimize the impact of the, of, of the commodity that single family homes have become. And it's, go we're, it's gonna take a challenge, you know, there will be legal challenges to it, but there are, the reality is the only way we move uh, from, the, from the manner in which housing prices are set now where you know, folks bid it up, and, I, and I'll give a better example in just a second, is that we have to be intentional in it. And I'll, I'll use this example. In Inglewood, all right, I moved in in 67, graduated from high school in 72, got elected to the city council in 81. The medium family income in Inglewood was greater, was, was the highest in any community of color in the United States, and, the, and, and yet, the housing values remained the same as they were prior to those families moving in. The incomes in the community went up as black folks moved in, and yet housing values stayed the same. Housing prices stayed the same. 2011, the result of, as, as we've descri described it and the research now tells us, the development of Playa Vista created a community of folks whose average income was near $200,000. They looked beyond Playa Vista for places to live. They, lived in, they worked in Silicon Beach, they looked in other places, and instantly they found communities like Inglewood where a two-bedroom home on a 3,500 you know, 3, footprint on a 5,000 square foot lot 
they could buy cash for $4,000, for $400,000. Immediately, Inglewood became a hot ticket. That same home that I sold to a first time home buyer, a home I grew up in, I sold for $300,000, turned over last year for $906,000. That young family made a windfall profit, but no new family in the neighborhood could afford to buy that home right. again. All right? So we have to figure out how we, if we're interested in single family home ownership, how we work to create a system where folks who can, who can, who are working and and willing and investing and looking to grow in their neighborhoods, how they can rebuy them. I and it's not a. I'm not suggesting it's simple. I'm suggesting it takes an intentional workaround with all of us talking about it, and not the sort of supply side economics that we see being captured in the legislation that's coming down from Sacramento. But, but like, what, so what are the top lines of that solution that you're talking about? Like what? I mean, I, I preach. I agree with you. We have to figure this out. What comes to what? What are you thinking of as the as as the solutions? I, and I apologize. I'm I have a hearing problem. So you, I, I, I guess I'm asking you. Pose the question. What are the solutions to your question? Uh, you know. So, so uh, it, other examples of things I've seen work um, in in San Diego County, in late '90s, early 2000s. They worked with some financial institutions, community development finance, CDFIs actually, that, that worked to transition renters to homeowners. And they accepted, the ownership, with, through the ownership, they accepted rental payments over a period of time as if they were uh, mortgage payments. And after a period of time, that, that renter and the owner agreed that now we're, we're selling you this home, All right? I think those, those opportunities exist here in Los Angeles County as well. But it doesn't have to be just a single family home. Why don't we, as part of this affordable housing initiative, sell the units to, that we build or that or we rehab to the people who live there? Give them a first time home loan and then let them use the equivalent of their rent to buy it. They're gonna be, take more, better care of it. <clears throat> They're gonna become voters. They're gonna be owners. They, they may have some limit like a co-op does on the total appreciation of the unit but they are building equity. Okay, um, we are running out of time, so if we can, from this point on, just keep the answers very, very short. Um, I think Council Member Mike Bonnet had a question. Does anyone else have a burning question? Because we do need to get into our next panel. I can hold mine. Uh, I'll wait. I mean, I'm, I'm fine going into the next panel. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a burning question because it's a hot topic in Sacramento. Um, and that's uh, a question about um, construction workers. Um, there's, there's quite a big debate in terms of um, creating good jobs uh, and creating affordable housing. And so I know there was a, a really tremendous study that uh, UC Berkeley Labor Center put out last week or the week before that talked about how there's a big difference in construction workers, commercial, uh, these high-level, skilled, um, well-paid, and residential, um, which uh, a good tendency is uh, that a, a family member of a residential construction worker ends up um, on uh, some type of public safety net program. And so um, as, as we're balancing this conversation about building, um, uh, and maybe this is Michael and a few others that can talk about uh, uh, sort of the need for uh, the actual job and the work that's done uh, to be such that they necessarily need to be back on a social safety net program or potentially um, a person that needs to be part of affordable housing. Well, I'll answer briefly. I just think that first of all that um, modular housing is part of the answers to, to produce the units in a factory setting uh, would not require as much uh, intensive labor. Also, I think that I 100% support union contracts and union labor, but I think that there are some add-ons to that that have been layered onto it that are, actually, in my own personal opinion, excessive, right? Uh, so I think there has to be some kind of balance. But certainly, you have to drive down the cost. It cannot be five or six hundred thousand. Um, that's an excellent question. I think what we have to do, when I mentioned it, we have to get with our building and trades partners. Everything to them is like, 
we got to build, we got to build, we got to keep jobs. One of the things is they're doing a great job of building places and, and, and attracting students early on in training to the construction and trades, both women and men. They're doing a good job about that. Southwest, uh, uh, one of the unions, is opening something, I think, in Torrance uh, to do right away to train students. That part they're good about. What they're not good about is understanding that he talked about the price of lumber. There are other materials that are fireproof, earthquake proof, reduce our carbon, hempcrete, for example. That's just an example. So look up hempcrete, everybody. But it seems to be hard to get our labor partners to understand, let's train people, let's look at that now. That brings the cost down of building. Now, is the lumber person going to be upset? No, because train them to, do, to use this product. We've got to start thinking and working with people that understand overall the big picture of how we can house more people. I also wanted to say many people renting are paying more than a house note now. But, and if they've been paying that house note, this gets to my, my point about public banking, uh, because the, other, the banks haven't demonstrated they're interested in doing this so much. Uh, but maybe credit unions will, I don't know. But they're paying that house note now, that rent. They've been paying this rent for years. They could have had a house. How are we not trying to connect the dots to make that happen? Just a Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. I want to thank the hearing panel. I want to thank our incredible witnesses.